Welcome to the show. This is Jason Sutton, a.k.a. The Guru, where it is my job to dissect, analyze, break down, and ultimately share with all of you the habits, routines, and life lessons of high performers in the teaching business, as well as all other domains and in between. On today's episode, I'm very excited to have my good friends James Ridyard and John Graham. For those of you that don't know, James Ridyard is a short game and wedge specialist uh, that teaches many players on the European Tour and has worked with several players on the PGA Tour. And John Graham is a putting coach that works with players on the PGA Tour and also the LPGA Tour. So I'm very excited to have them as together they make up the Short Game Secrets team. Today we talk about a variety of topics which include uh, their paths of success and how they got here, which ex- were extremely different, uh, what mentors that helped them along the way. We also discuss uh, the pros and cons of specializing in the teaching business, which was very interesting. Also, we give advice uh, to the young coaches out there that are getting into the teaching business and talk about things that they should be doing, and also mistakes that we see that young teachers make on the lesson tee, uh, which I think you'll find very interesting and helpful, especially for the young coaches out there. Uh, It was great to have the guys uh, in this weekend as we did a couple of short game schools, and then both of them spoke at uh, my guru workshop, which was uh, was another big success and had a nice little turnout. So it was great to to learn more uh, from these guys as I've learned so much over the years. Uh, from John with putting and then now James uh, with the wedge game, uh, watching him teach you know average golfers as well as pros was super helpful and I, I learned a lot and can't can't wait to get it back out onto the the short game area and give uh, give some more short game lessons. So without further ado, let's get to my conversation with James Ridyard and John Graham. I hope you enjoy. All right, guys, welcome to the show. Thanks so much uh, for being my first guest. We have a dual guest today uh, with John and, uh, and James. I appreciate you guys being here. So let's start with just taking us back to uh, the beginning of your career, maybe a little bit about your childhood, you know, how you got into the business, you know, this being a, a show that's uh, going to help other teachers. Uh, I think it's, it's good to kind of see what the pathway looked like for uh, two guys here that are definitely specializing in uh, a certain part of the instructional part of the game. Uh, we'll start with you, James. Just give us a little insight of, of where you started and give us some lineage. Uh, I wish you start with John. His story is so much more interesting. <laughs> um, because I'm actually a golfer. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that. That's okay. You know what I'm saying? That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I um, yeah, so I... I came from a golfing family, right? So the first experience of golfing, I was probably about four years old. Um, and then, like most kids, or I hope most kids, started playing other sports and stuff, so golf kind of took a back seat. Um, so I was a teenager, broke my leg playing rugby, and suddenly I didn't want to do that anymore and started playing more and more golf. And got to a reasonably decent level, decent standard before I pretty much put the clubs away, university. Didn't play there, did lots of other extracurricular activities instead. Um, and then picked up my clubs again afterwards and started to, to play a little bit more. Um, my dream, obviously, I think most players was to play competitively. Um, I think I had no real idea at the time just how good you need to be you know, to actually make money and make a living. Um, so I threw plenty of it down the train, just like probably 99% of the population to play. Uh, I think on the back of that and the experience playing competitively and not being good enough, kind of oh yeah, pretty much every other teacher let me have a path of teaching. Like I have the same bog standard story as everyone else, which is why John's is so much better than. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll throw it over to him. I think maybe we'll elaborate a little bit further on later. Yeah, later yeah. sure. To go with that. That's kind of the beginning. For sure, we can we can go in a lot of different directions in this, but I think yeah, John's John's story is definitely <laughs> fascinating. Uh, well, being I a putting coach, I don't, I don't know if it's, it's fascinating. It's certainly <laughs> different than most other golf pros. 
Um, I, I didn't play any golf as a kid. I was a, a ten pin bowler. Depending on what part of the country you're from, you're either duck pin or candle pin or ten pin. I was a ten pin bowler, which is regular bowling for most people. Uh, and I did that all through my junior career. I did it in high school, uh, bowled at Michigan State. Uh, I, I wanted to be a professional bowler. That's what I worked for. Uh, I had won tournaments. I'd done well in college. And then uh, after I graduated college, I uh, worked at a bowling alley and uh, uh, up in the northeast of the U.S. And uh, as typical bowling alleys do, they closed down in the summertime and I needed a job to find something to do. And a friend of mine who I bowled with worked at a golf course. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds like fun. I'll give that a try. And I showed up to the golf course and I had, went to the head pro and I said, I'm you know, looking for a job. He goes, okay, no problem. Show up tomorrow, 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to have your gas and all the golf carts, and then uh, we'll get you going. I said, okay, sounds good. So I showed up the next morning at 4 o'clock, not a soul at the golf course. And I stand around, and I kind of wait. About 4.30, the pro rolls up, and uh, I said, you know, I'm here to do the, the carts. And he goes, who are you again? I said, I'm, uh, I came in for a job interview. I said, I want to work at the golf course. And you're here. I said, yeah, you told me to come at 4 o'clock in the morning. He goes, oh, I usually just tell that to people they never show up. So <laughs> that's how I got into the golf business is I started working at this place doing carts and gas and oiling them up. And then I worked at the range and then I worked in the shop. And then all the while I was just learning how to play. I, I picked it up when I was 24-ish or so and uh, got pretty good pretty quick. And um, I was on the golf course one day. Uh, right before I was to bowl in a summer league that was that I bowled in with a, a friend of mine and it was a beautiful sunny 70 degree day no wind and I left the golf course like mid round and ran to the bowling alley you know it was like this super small dark and smoky and dreary place and I'm like well that's the end of this I'm done with bowling I'm gonna just do golf because at least it's nice outside and uh, so I started to pursue golf and I uh, wanted to play professionally, like most teaching pros, I think, uh, at one point in time, as James mentioned, wanted to do. And uh, I got pretty good pretty quick, but like James said, I, don't, I didn't have any real idea of how good the actual good players are. Uh, and I figured it out pretty quick that uh, I had a big miss to the right with my driver. Everything else was pretty good, but every once in a while I just hit it off the planet. And uh, I knew that just wasn't going to be was going to be useful. You you never or you didn't always just specialize in putting as well, right? And like both of you guys did teach some full swing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. And we'll, yeah. 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 After I quit playing, I, I went to be a club pro. I didn't have any ideas of wanting to teach. Uh, and the first job that I got, the guy just threw me out into a clinic and said, "Here, go teach these ten ladies." I had no idea what I was doing, but I really enjoyed it and kind of ended up going down that road. Uh, then I was a full swing guy for quite a while. I uh, coached a college team for a little while and thought I was going to get out of teaching and just do that. Um, and then by that time, I now started to have two or three or four kids by that time. And then I really started to specialize on this putting stuff, which is kind of where I am now. Two or three or four kids. Yeah, two or three. <laughs> I, just, I just keep making them. I just, every, every winter I show up and there's another one there. John, was it was out of interest, was there a moment when you were like pursuing the I want to play dream and you suddenly thought, oh my God, I'm nowhere near. Uh, I know that was for me. Was there a breaking point? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it was. Um, Tell us about that. <laughs> it was. It was uh, the seventeenth hole at, at Locust Hill Country Club. Oh, he knows playing. the hole even. Oh yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, this is bad memory. This is <laughs> right. Yeah. This is great. It's a par five, dog leg right, and uh, it would be the first time in a tournament I have a chance to shoot in the sixties. Now I'd shot an under par, but I know we're looking seventy in a tournament, and it's a reachable par five, and uh, all I got to do is just put it somewhere where I can hit my next shot, and I. You know, I stood over it and I just blew it way to the right and ended up not shooting in the 60s and I got home that day and I'm like I just can't handle the pressure that I'm going to put on myself knowing that I had this problem that's sometime going to show up and that was it. Yeah, it's not going to work because I remember that I was playing um, in Florida and I moved over and the, the first event I played the course was like 7,400 yards and it was windy. And after the first round, I came in a couple under. I thought I probably could have picked up two or three more. Maybe five under was on the card for me today. Absolute best. And I walked in, and, and it's like, who just tore us to the scoreboard? The leader was in the bar. <laughs> and I walk in, people drinking beers, and I look up, and I'm like, wow, a couple under. And I look down the board, and someone shot 10 under. First round, and this wind on this tough golf course, a Florida golf course. Water everywhere, wind. I just thought, I've not got that. 
I, I've never got that in the locker. I never will. Um, so what am I doing? That was your reality check. Yeah, but I just carried on playing anyway after that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're giving your money away. Yeah. I can do this. I can do this. Oh, no, I've not got 10 under on a windy day. 7,500 on a golf course. It's just not there. Um, so how did you get led into the to the short game space? Oh. I know you did some stuff with, with Mike and Andy at you know, Stack and Till. Yeah, and they were very involved. And I know you learned a lot about classifying swings and some things that led you to where you're at now. Yeah, did a lot of full swing stuff. Um, argued with plenty of people about things. I think, like with everyone, you, you kind of, you kind of align with a certain group and you have beliefs and you go down that route and then you kind of move on and keep growing as, as a teacher. Right. Um, and this is, is not like an unknown story, but um, I was pretty much full swing exclusive until 2010 when I found myself in this situation where somebody asked me to look at their short game and my thoughts and I actually just flat out refused because I didn't feel like I could offer him you didn't, you didn't let, you weren't comfortable with the answer you were going to give no <laughs> no and my, my answer was I don't do short game and that was like a real tail between the legs moment after that I got like fired by him not much later <laughs> on the back of that which wasn't a surprise I'd do the same thing yeah. um I think as a player, you need to have a certain degree of belief in the guy that's guiding you in whatever respect it may be. And someone comes out and says that, you think, well, that, that's who this guy may not be who I thought they were. Right. Um, so, yeah, that kind of it was embarrassing and didn't force me into research and stuff, but I wanted answers because I didn't want to be on the spot again in a position where I couldn't give an answer that I believed was good enough. Mm. And so that kind of pushed me into that space. Yeah. That kind of leads us into to my next question is, you know, what I really admire about the way both of you go about teaching. And, you know, we just did, you know, two days at my club with, with James and then I've watched John teach a lot and have learned so much from both of you is, the, is how you take your time in what I would call the testing phase, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, building the, the picture of, of what the player's doing. So talk a little bit about, you know, from a short game perspective and then, then putting, how important the testing phase is and also sort of, I guess, give us a picture of what you look at and how you would start to work with a player. Um, do you want me to say this first? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. You're, you're right, I, I take my time and you, you actually asked me yesterday, so what could I do? The longest session do you do at home? Not like a couple of hours, right. a minute. Yeah. You know, yeah, I can see why. <laughs> I can see why it would take that long. Sure. Um, I, I can dream of doing a 30 minute lesson now because I just don't think you can take on enough information in that time and actually feed back to the player and get some kind of loop going on where they kind of fail and succeed and you keep guiding them and improving them. Um, and because I give myself that time, I'm in no rush, like you said, to analyze or overanalyze. Um, as a, it's almost, it's very, I find it very difficult to sit there and go, this is what I look at first because I'm look, trying to see the whole picture at the same time. I'm trying to see what makes up everything. Um, Robbie sitting over there in the corner quietly was watching yesterday and I, I almost bumped into him a few times. I was giving this lesson and he thought he was at a safe distance. But I'd be walking around and I'd, I'd be almost walking backwards and oh, there he was, stepped on his toes. I was like, you're probably going to notice that I stand a lot further away than you might think. Right. For getting a different perspective of whatever you're looking at yeah, is I'm is huge. literally trying to see the whole picture. Right. I'm not just looking at the player and what they're doing right there. I'm looking at the ball and the outcome and everything. I'm trying to see every drink and everything I possibly can. Yeah, that, that kind of will keep on this topic, but it kind of leads me into one of the questions was, what are some of the mistakes that you see young coaches make uh, in both you know, genres of putting in, in short game and I think that would definitely fall in that category where they, they try to jump in a little too quick without getting an idea of you know a good proper interview or seeing them hit different different shots would you yeah, agree with that? No, I'll, I'll more often than not will have a good chip around the room with somebody I'll grab my own wedge or one of their wedges and I'll chip against them so I don't want to just watch them drag balls and try to hit the shot after shot I want to move them around I want to push the buttons a little bit test change them the environment yeah I want to make them uncomfortable and I can make them extra uncomfortable because they're now competing against me as well yeah the competition piece is, adds the pressure yeah, exactly trying to recreate that real world environment best you can so you bring out the worst in people because that's what I want I don't want someone to come up and find a rhythm after five or six shots and start hitting good shots I want to see what the first ball does every single time so yeah I try and beat people up best I can 
I think that's so valuable for, for coaches out there to learn. I uh, know obviously sometimes we have time constraints, but still I think it's a, it's a more valuable lesson if you can take that time and give them a couple of things rather than take them in the wrong direction without getting enough. Yeah, you're, you're giving me far better off giving them a couple of valuable pieces of information and 10 pieces of invaluable. All right. They don't, they're not paying you by the word as well. So that's, another that's observation so people will say sometimes that I can't believe how little you say. Well, if you pick your words carefully and your timing is good at them, you don't need to speak a great deal. So I think a, a, a young coach, people try and fill the time with words, almost to the point where the player can barely get a word in or hit a shot. Not getting feedback from the student, definitely not student-centered. Exactly, so yeah. overwhelming for the student as much as anything mm -hmm. else. What about you, John? I know because I've, I've literally taken every piece of <laughs> testing uh, part of you know, giving a, a putting lesson from you over the years and it's improved my putting instruction so much because now it's my 20 minute putting lesson has turned into three hours yeah. but I've become so much better at, at recognizing patterns so tell us a little bit about the importance of that and, and what you you do yeah it's well putting is a to me is a slightly different animal because like in, in almost every other part of the game the the student that comes to you is trying to get their ball to behave like they see on TV. They're trying to either pitch it high or spin it or check it or curve it one way or the other or not curve it or hit it far. Uh, and with putting, you can take anybody off the street and give them something that's not even a putter and say, hey, roll this ball on the ground and the ball will behave exactly like a tour player will. So the actual movement of the ball part isn't really the piece that's valuable anymore. Where in every other part of golf it is. That's what they're trying to learn. They're trying to make the ball do something in terms of how it's going to behave. In putting, the ball behaves the same for everyone. So the trick is now, how do I get that behavior to be the behavior that they uh, want that runs through the hole? Uh, so for me, the putting assessment part uh, is the most valuable because there's really three pieces of this puzzle is, you know, can they start it where they want to? Can they hit it the distance they want to? And can they hit it in the direction that is correct where the hole will get in the way? That would be the green meeting piece. So my assessment is fairly uh, involved and I want to check all three of those parts to see which of these three is the lowest hanging fruit. Um, most people picture a putting lesson as a putting strokes mechanic check. Uh, for me, a putting lesson is a combination of all of those things. Um, and that usually probably comes later in the process yeah. where I think a lot of the mistakes I've made in the past is I've started there first and don't get enough information. Like reverse engineering is kind of what I call it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. For, for most players, the stroke mechanics isn't the lowest hanging fruit. They need help with it, but they can get better faster, uh, usually with some other things, either speed or, or green reading or something of that nature, or even just conceptual of like, how does the how do these pieces fit together? Uh, so for me, uh, the assessment that I do, I continue to tweak it and play with it. Uh, to try and bring, uh, and I think one of the hardest things to do as a coach is to not bring out any biases during that phase. Like like James, uh, and this is fairly new for me, I, I try to speak a lot less than I used to. Uh, and especially during the assessment part, I try to say almost nothing. Uh, right, so you don't hand, influence. So I don't influence what they're going to do. Right. I want to see kind of who, what they really do. Um, and when I've been at, at workshops with James when we're working together, and I'm uncomfortable listening to nothing. <laughs> where I'll start just asking James questions. What do you think about this? What do you think about this? <laughs> just to get some noise and some volume going on and, and getting comfortable with silence and getting comfortable with, uh, as, a, as a coach, um, because I think silence makes players uncomfortable also. And it gets them thinking and it gets them asking questions. If, if you're always talking, the player doesn't do any of the question asking. If you're just silent and you're kind of watching, mm. eventually they just start to see like, well, what do, you, what do you see? What do you think I should do? Something They start to do something. Uh, and you need to give them a chance to, to do that. Uh, so for me, the assessment part uh, is everything because it starts me down the road of, of what we're going to go and, and why. Yeah, I think that's that's such great advice for any coach, but I think the, the young coaches that we're trying to reach out there is take your time, gather as much information, observe more, talk less, yeah. I think would be, would be awesome. And that's sort of my next question is like, what advice would you give a young PGM student uh, for a professional that is looking to teach, uh, what do they need to do? What do they need to learn? And like, what kind of blueprint would you give them? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I would 
certainly advise them to, to listen to as many different people as they can find. Um, to uh, find the people that are trying to answer the questions, and this is a, a quote and a thing that we've lived by uh, for a while, uh, but then when you find somebody who says they have all the questions, you run away from those people. But you, you look for the people that are trying to answer them all. Uh, once somebody says they've got the answer, well, then they've, they've quit learning, they've stopped. It's time to move on to, to other ways. Um, it's a gosh. It's it's a difficult environment. I mean, I would get online. There's so much. There's so much more information and access there than there ever used to be. Right. Um, you you have to, uh, in my opinion, you have to try to um, be outgoing. You have to try to meet people. You have to try to talk to people. You have to uh, seek out information. You have to learn. Now, when it comes to the actual teaching part, uh, we've touched on it a little bit already. It's it's definitely easier to speak less when you know more that's a it's great it's really hard to talk very quote. little when you don't when you don't know very much sure but when you know a lot it's it's it, it takes time to be able to answer the little check boxes that you have running through your head okay does he do this does he do this does he do this when you don't know that those boxes are there you just say something you gotta you gotta get it going right. so it's hard to not talk until you know a lot um but once you get to that point where you start feeling comfortable not saying things um it's better for the student. Uh, they can really uh, learn and, and play and fail. They need to be comfortable failing. As a coach, you need to watch your student fail all the time and be okay with it. That's it's, something that I think is so bad. And we just talked about that before before we came on about how James did that constantly today is leaving them alone to sort of figure out the information they've been given right. and let them, let them mess up for a little bit and right. then impart something when they're ready. Exactly. It's, you're not abandoning them. You're not just saying, okay, well, you're, you're a failure. I'm going to move on. You're letting them figure it out because they're not everyone, but most people will, when they're failing, they will try to figure out why and they'll try to adjust. And that adjustment, if they get that adjustment correct on their own, it has way more value than if I give it to them. Uh, so let them, let them try to figure it out a little bit on their own. Give them guidance, kind of give them some uh, guardrails, if you will. And don't go down here. Don't go over here. Just kind of stay in this area. And let them let them learn, let them grow, let them figure it out a little bit. Yeah, James, stop spoon feeding them. Yeah. Um, the the original question was about young coaches. Yeah, young coach, what advice right, would you give so, young coaches that are yeah. getting into the teaching game, and sort of what road path or would, would you? Yeah, give them? I, one one thing I would obviously John said you just learn from everyone that you can, and that's hundred percent right, but. Young coaches shouldn't be afraid of aligning themselves with a methodology or a system, right? Because it's not it's not like some kind of lifetime commitment that you make that you can go into these and there are there are a few, there are going to these groups and you can learn a ton of stuff that you can keep some of and disregard other things and move and grow and build. Um, and I think it's very easy to be actually turned off from aligning yourself with methodolo methodologies groups because people kind of make I think that's a bit unfair because there's some really smart people with, within these groups and it can only improve what you do to be part of them. Sure. You just got to know kind of when to pull the plug and move on and do your own thing. Facebook or, groups and the, yeah. The, not, not even, not even like social media. I'm talking literally teaching groups like, oh, gotcha. like did Jim Hardy's, right? Yeah. yeah. So, well, I don't know what it's called. Like, plain truth. Plain truth. That's it. Right. I was going to say one second, two plain that's, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Right. plain so, truth. John, you used to have connections oh, yeah. in that, right? Yeah. I, have, I have connections with Second Silver, but I was with Mike and Andy. Right. Um, and I think there was a reluctance for a certain proportion of the market to actually get involved with that because they see it as kind of a cultish yeah. thing. I can tell you that it, when I started learning, and I don't, you probably don't even remember uh, when I sort of met you on Twitter years ago, that I was made a offhanded comment about stack and tilt that I regret, and I always tell people that you know don't ever judge anything until you know it inside and out. And I started to get, do a deep dive into it, and it changed my whole teaching philosophy in a really, really positive way. And now I still use quite a bit of the pieces that I learned from you. So and I'm sure you took the pieces and understanding yeah. that you took from that and developed it into your Yeah, I learned a valuable life thing. lesson in that. that exactly. I apologize if I've never said sorry to you. Uh, you know, <laughs> you may not even remember. It's affected him deeply. I'd, yeah. <laughs> I'd be lying if I said I could remember. Uh, yeah, perfect. That's good because it bothers me because I know we're so good friends now, but 
it was something that I regret saying. Yeah, you, you wouldn't. You wouldn't be the only one. Um, <laughs> don't, don't worry. Um, I think if if, if, they ne- if players never get or coaches, sorry, never get involved with these groups, they miss out on so much. Um, and being aware that you, you're going to hopefully have a long career doing this, like decades. What's a couple of years lining yourself with one person? It's not going to destroy you. It's only going to make you grow. Yeah, influences. So that, that's a good. It's a great segue into my next question, which is. Give me a couple of people, it doesn't have to be even be in the golf business, that have been mentors to you guys or big influences on your career, your teaching, or your life. And maybe a story. Well, I'll go first as well. You're thinking of making faces. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, would, I, would, I would pick out three people probably. Um, one would be um, Mark Sweeney, who was the founder of Aimpoint. He had a huge influence of me uh, and helping me kind of go in the direction that I currently am. Um, the second would be uh, Chris Como, who I, I met at a uh, Brian Manzella, Who's that? the call GTE, maybe? Who's that? He's some, some guy. <laughs> great, great guy. Who that? Who that? <laughs> um, and I had, I had asked the question at this particular seminar that I actually got from James because, you know, the, during that particular time of our coaching careers, there was a, we were much more full swing and we were talking about things. And I had asked the question at the seminar that, that they couldn't answer or they refused to answer. And, uh, and then Chris came over to me and he's like, hey, those guys never really answered your question. I'm like, yeah, I know. And we just got to talking. We had a very similar uh, devil's advocate type of personality. Definitely. We, we would challenge... Uh, our own points of view on purpose just to see how well it would hold up against someone else. So Chris and I might have a discussion of some topic that we both already agreed on a particular answer. One person would take the opposite view and then we would argue with each other to see how well you could support your position. Uh, And I've always enjoyed that kind of thing. Uh, And then the third one, to be honest, would would be James because James kind of got me into the online part of it, uh, got me into uh, some different avenues of where to learn from, who to learn from, and how to learn. And then uh, our, our business partnership that we started, that was 100% his idea and uh, has opened up another whole set of avenues uh, all over the world. So I would say those three for me. Very good. James? Uh, right. What do you think about this Twitter thing? He's going to take off. <laughs> no, has yeah, no yeah. chance. Honestly, oh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what you can yeah. across in like 140 characters. <laughs> that doesn't make much yeah. sense to me. Yeah. Was that nine years ago? Ten years ago? Yeah, the right. things. Yeah, yeah. The, that's when we all sort of met when social started getting yeah. really, really busy. 2008, yeah, I mean, I 2009. Precisely being in the dining room, and I, I don't know how I found it, but I found that you were on Twitter, and I. And I well, maybe we were maybe Skyping at that time or something. I'm like, I'm going to try this too. <laughs> and then I just followed every way that James yeah. followed. And, and I was a Twitter addict for a long time. And John and I met because he sent me a nice note about how my D-plane video was not 100% correct in <laughs> 2008, 2009. By the way. <laughs> and he said, I humbly urge you to check this out. Yeah. And again, very nice, you know, wasn't, and, and we became... I must have been in a good mood that day. You were, yeah, I was going to say, you were, you were really nice, and I was just like, wow. But again, I didn't take offense to it. I was like, yeah, I was wrong. Let's figure this out. And then that took me down a whole path, and we became friends and relationships that we've that we've had. It's been extraordinary. All right, so, so you, haven't, you haven't answered the question yet. No, I'm avoiding it. <laughs> just, just with what you just said, it's, it's almost... I don't want to say essential, but it's essential that you are open to being entirely incorrect about stuff in your business, business as much as your ego wants you to be right. Um, I see so many closed off people because of ego. Um, and I think everyone's guilty of it at some point. I certainly am too, but you try your best not to be. Because again, you're just you're closing doors. Um, right, anyway, the mentors thing, uh, Andy. Andy Plummer for sure for the longest time. Now, um, don't speak to him a great deal anymore. He's doing his thing. Um, I'm doing my way across paths with friendly and uh, still friends. Um, and I, I think you probably couldn't have a better apprenticeship under somebody if you're just looking at mechanics of how the golf swing works. Now, model irrespective, just understand how everything functions and learning how things work together. You, you, you couldn't pick a better person. 
and it's even awesome in that respect, but then they've got a complete other end of the spectrum. I'd count Claude Harmon as a mentor to me in a professional sense, in a coaching sense. I mean, he absolutely did, and he will probably, hopefully, when I'm saying this, but he busts my ball sometimes. But sometimes we need that. Somebody right. in your face telling you, look, what you're doing here is wrong. You need to suck it up, change your behavior there, and, and do this instead. And I know for a fact he didn't like me when he first met, spoke to me. So <laughs> kind of turned that around and yeah, that's turned in my favor and, and seen him as a mentor. And uh, John, John says I, I am to him, and he certainly is to me in many respects. Um, we have kind of similar ish home lives with a bunch of kids and kind of similar careers. We've, I don't think either of us ever spent 12 hours a day on a lesson to you. And I've certainly never wanted to, which is one of the reasons why I think we both diversify to a point. Yeah. And, we, and we were both very honest and, and comfortable being uh, wrong. Like it, it's it's important to surround yourself with people that I hate being wrong. That you can oh, that you can be <laughs> that, that you can be critical oh, too, and, and critic and, be, and then they receive criticism, but they don't take it in a personal manner. Like there's been plenty of times where we would have a discussion, and one of us would be right or wrong or whatever, but. The, the movement toward learning was what the goal was. We didn't really care. We didn't attach any emotion to the information. Information was just a separate thing. Uh, it's, it's easy to be friends when you don't attach emotion to information. It's just words on paper or words in your head. It's, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I've got many, many great friendships. I've like yours, John's, you just gave the example. We, I think we started by arguing about something. Yeah, we were arguing at uh, a Golf WRX forum about a, a, a swing that had no backswing. <laughs> the no backswing, <laughs> the no backswing thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That mean, I don't know that Yeah, and I said something, I, and then uh, he commented something sarcastically, but I didn't even understand it because it had like a smiley face and a super grin. And then I had to go search all, all the stuff he was talking about. He was speaking in golf machine lingo at the time, and I barely even knew what he was talking about. <laughs> but a bunch of other people did, and they were kind of going back and forth, kind of making fun of me, I think. And I had to go research everything. Uh, what, what, what are these guys even talking about? There's accumulators and whatever, wedges. <laughs> Like, yeah. oh, there's there's something I don't know here. Yeah, don't be scared. Um, there's a there's a teaching point right there though, yeah. right in that. There's this assumption right now that because people talk in maybe an anatomically correct manner, right, they like to use like a unit. And it's a yes. anatomical terms are a universal language, right? That everyone for teachers now, right? Yeah. yeah. That in the medical industry, everyone will talk to each other in that way, and it'd be overwhelming for a patient. Right. right, and we're in the same place in that people are trying to communicate certain things in a certain way that may be overwhelming for the student. Um, but that doesn't mean for a second that just because teachers are having a public discussion about something that that's what they do on the lesson team. Right, I think uh, that's a great point. I mean, I know I was going to bring that up because you, you, because we've had discussions about four D and some things that you know are happening in the pitching stroke and. I understand what you're saying when we say radial and ulnar and mm -hmm. flexion, but when not see you teach, you're explaining and you're describing things in positions, but it's so simple for the student and they get it. You don't have to, you know, and that's, I think that's where the disconnect is a lot of times, like you said, it's, okay, this guy's too technical, but he's really, if go watch him teach, right? Don't, yeah. don't judge somebody because they've made a post on Twitter or on Facebook about this because they're, they're talking to other teachers. Yeah, um, I'm, that's my multilingual. <laughs> I don't speak a second language, but I can, I can communicate golf stuff in a ton of different ways. Yeah. For, I mean, over the last two days, how many times have you seen me say deviation? Or owner, or, or None. yeah, or but they get uncocked. I mean, they can understand uncocked. Yeah. They, but the thing is, you can use that language as long as you explain what that looks like or feels like to the student, and then they get it. Like you yeah. use flex a couple of times, and you made the, yeah. you know, made that sort of clear to them what that meant, and nobody ever said once, I don't understand. Yeah. So I think it's the communication piece that a lot of people miss. Um, and when I, you know, I don't use a ton of technical terms in my teaching, but when I do, I make sure that I'm describing it in a way that the student definitely gets it. If not, then I'm not doing my job. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you have to tailor your message according to the person in front of you. For and, sure. And that is a skill, right? You can't learn that at a seminar or in a book. That's like school of hard knocks and experience, right? Yeah. So what did you, you said something of so brilliant the other night. 
at dinner, you said uh, there's no certification and experience. Yeah. Yeah. But that was because there was, wasn't it? That was fantastic. You could sell that program today. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah but I mean, the young guys don't want to hear that, obviously. But it's you know, and probably sitting right here. But I tell them that all the time. Like, just be patient. Mm -hmm. You know, you're doing everything you need to do, gathering the information, getting the experience of teaching, and then it'll all sort of come together. Yep. You can't rush experience, can you? All right. Yeah, that's all right. So, so let's let's switch gears a little bit. So, um, well, actually, I have one more question, and then we'll switch gears. But, what are your thoughts? Uh, again, like for young coaches, on specializing versus teaching everything. Uh, for me, I, I think that's a personal choice. Um, I, I didn't. I didn't ever intend to specialize as a putting coach. That wasn't why I got into teaching, I, I, I just ended up here. Um, I was a full swing person, I was a college coach, um, and I, you know, during that time you had to do everything between monitoring grades and emotions and girlfriends and whatever, so it's like a whole different deal. Um, but specializing, depending on if you ever figure out what you want to do, because uh, I'm still not sure that I've figured it out, I, I enjoy what I do, but specializing can provide a certain faster pathway to certain outcomes. Um, but it can also close a whole lot of doors because you just don't have the opportunity to work in other areas. So it, uh, it has pluses and minuses um, like most things do, but uh, specializing again for me was more of a necessity. I needed to do it. Um, uh, I was heavily doing uh, Aimpoint Green Reading for a long time, uh, and I quickly saw that while that part was extremely useful, it didn't answer all of the problems. So in order to just make that more useful, I had to do this other stuff. Um, so for me, it, it, it wasn't necessarily a choice per se, I just, it was required, I had, I had to do it. Um, and then the nature of the actual field of putting was uh, interesting to me. Um, but I certainly didn't get into golf teaching to be a putting coach. I, I just kind of just evolved. Just kind of evolved and yeah. ended up here. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. So I, I think it can go either way. What about you, James? I know you're sort of getting back into some full swing stuff. Yeah, I've, you've I've, sort of I've made never, your name for you know being the short game guy. Yeah, I've never really stopped doing full swing stuff. Um, I'll try and keep myself up to date with everything best I can as well. And in, in the same respect as I'm always trying to research short game stuff, I'm trying to keep up with everyone else full swing wise um, you know you were just saying we were saying a moment ago and I think I think everyone specializes without even knowing it I mean your your typical golf coach will stand there and give X amount of lessons per day and probably 90% of them will be in a range bay which is going to be full swing so they're almost specializing in full swing without even realizing they're doing it mm -hmm. So because someone chooses to do something in a different arena or a part of it, putting green, chipping green, whatever, they're just specializing somewhere else. I think everyone's, everyone's doing it. Um, was it a deliberate ploy to try and fill the gap in the market? No. Nope. Could have been. I know a lot of people think it was, um, but I wasn't looking to get into it. And I'm going to say niche. You won't get that. You say niche. <laughs> <laughs> He's screwing up our language terribly. Um, I'll forgive you. I, I didn't. I don't think it's ever really that intentional. It's not as cynical as I'm going to do this because no one else is. This, again, it was necessity, 100 percent for me. All right. So switching gears a little bit, a little bit out of the box question is: If you had to teach a class to a group of college students that didn't involve golf, what subject would it be, and why? Oh, God. Um, I'm the teacher, or am I? You're the teacher. Of, I'm teaching it. Hmm. Just to get a little dive into your, because I know both of you are very well read and study a lot of different topics. Gosh, that's a, that's an interesting question because now, now I've got to decide: do I want to do it because I enjoy it? Do I want to do it because I'm uh, just good take, at it? Take emotion out of it. Just something you would think you could actually do. Oh, well. something that I could do. I could I could teach uh, accounting. I could teach a statistics class. I could teach an uh, introduction to physics class. Uh, accounting, accounting or statistics would be the easiest. But would you enjoy that? 
No. no I, I, I never even mentioned this in my in my initial bio, but I used to be an auditor at a bank before. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, before I got into golf, this was between those two things. I worked at a uh, what used to be it's called Fleet now, but I was a, a, an auditor in the mutual fund department. So I used to check to make sure that the amount of shares that they bought he matched the amount of money that they spent and all that kind of stuff. So I, uh, numbers I'm very very comfortable with. I can do them very well. I can like I can see how the patterns work. I can do all that no problem. Uh, I don't necessarily enjoy it, but I can do it. I, I can't pick she was in the order, so. Yeah, I had, <laughs> yeah, I had, I had a cubicle yeah. right by the window. That's Just, great. Yeah, awesome. for, for two winners, or two years. Shared tie. How about you, James? Shared tie, yeah, I was a bank teller once also. Uh, oh what, what would I feel comfortable teaching in college class? Um, problem solving 101. <laughs> okay. Because I think I'm the kind of person where if I don't know the answer, I will go and find it. And I know how to go and find answers and solve questions that are beyond my instinct capability. So I think I could probably help people to do that too. I think that's a characteristic of characteristic of most good coaches. I would say. Would you agree? Yeah. Well, most yeah. the, the top coaches are going to have that curiosity or. How to Google 101. Yeah, how to Google. Yeah, <laughs> right. Honestly, so many people so have Google. no idea how to Google. If you, if you went back through text between me and you over the last decade, the amount of times that my response was, Google it. <laughs> to a question you had. Oh yeah, that's Especially awesome. It was a I, I figured it out eventually. But I'm just gonna yeah. if I ask him a question, you're just gonna tell me to figure it out myself. <laughs> Go find the answer yourself. That's um, good. Yeah, but this is also this this methodology is behind problem solving as well. So I think that'll be kind of cool to share with people. It's not all about Google. All right, what book or couple of books have had the greatest influence on your life or career, or books that you maybe have gifted? Uh, I, I would say the one that that pushed me over the edge to want to stay with golf was a book called Quantum Golf, I think it's called. It was mm -hmm. written by a Swedish guy. So, uh, a short book. Um, uh, rumor actually has it that, it's, that the book is uh, in part related to a guy that I used to work for who was a golf pro in Iowa. His name was Lonnie Nielsen. Um, but it was super fluidity was the main thing about how to, how to stay relaxed and free in your mind and free in your body when, you're, when you make a golf swing. Uh, Do this. Do less. Do less. <laughs> yeah, and that, that, that book kind Do of over the edge. To say, I'm going to try this golf thing. Good. God, honestly. I don't know about a good answer for you. It can't be stuck until the book, because we all know that was <laughs> pre. <laughs> um, what was the question? What's, like, like, so what, what book has had an influence? It, can't, it doesn't have to be golf. Yeah, it could be so anything. Like golf related. Yeah, I mean, maybe not in golf related. The internet? Yeah, I mean, I know <laughs> nowadays, <laughs> right? So it, it, when I'm talking to the young guys like Robbie, it's like we had to read. We're looking at my library there. Now it's videos, podcasts, mm -hmm. and, you know, we're getting it through audio or video rather than actually having to read the books or it's a Kindle or whatnot. So Yeah, and I've got a ton of books in boxes like in my garage that I don't know if I look through my look at it and go, oh. My God, yeah, that was that was influential off the top of my head. Really tough. Okay, um, well, we can come back to it. It's not. Yeah, let's revisit that one. Let's, let's revisit let's that. Contemplate. Yeah, I would say at least as far as my teaching career goes, the internet was the most. Right now, like you said, it's so much easier to find information. You can just about see. Well, it's, not, it's not even just the information. It's the connections. It's the network. It's right. The, Social media. Right. You know, it's all that. But the, the cool thing is how it's evolved since we started, like 2008, 2009-ish, um, where Twitter was big, now it's Instagram, and now it's Snapchat, now it's the, you know, the other uh, platforms that have, that have come about. Mm -hmm. um, what, do you, what would you say you spend the most time on now as far as gathering information or oh, as far as talking gathering, to people? Yeah, as far as gathering information, I, I do it more uh, personal now. I, I do less um, seeking it out and in terms of like just kind of putting it out on the internet or go searching for it somewhere on the internet. 
uh, I feel like I've gotten to meet enough people where I, if I have a particular question on a particular topic, I know who to call. Yeah. Uh, so I, we used I, to I call that the mastermind crew. Yeah. All right now yeah. I call them my personal board of directors <laughs> that you guys are included, but yeah, the people you can reach out to that yeah. know stuff. Yeah. And if, and if they don't know them, they know the person that, that will know. Right. Them. Uh, so I do more of it that way now. All right. So if you had the opportunity to get one message, whether it's a quote, a saying, or a life lesson to the world, whether it's on TV or a billboard or, you know, shot from space, however you want to do it now, uh, what would it be? I know what mine is. Do you have one? I, I think everyone in the room knows what mine is. <laughs> what you should do. <laughs> What's yours? Oh, it's the it's the quote that I start every presentation with. It's from Voltaire. It's uh, well, uh, uncertainty is an uncomfortable position. Uh, certainty is an absurd position. Be comfortable not knowing that you just don't know everything and you can't know it all. You can't always be right. That's good. I love this right because when you, you go and sit in seminars and presentations and someone opens with a quote, it's, it's something like that. It's in uh, parentheses, or oh, do both commas over it. Says Voltaire. In the year, and then mine is like, do less. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> I love it. So, I love it. it uh, how many times have I said it the last couple of days? And it's yeah. not just because it's like some right now thing. It's from a film called Forgetting Sarah Marshall, which is probably from 2009 or something like that. It's almost 10 years old. And it's, you're listening, whoever's listening is probably won't recall it or may do may not right so it's a surfing scene and the instructor's on the beach and he's teaching the guy peter to stand up uh, on the board i know the scene right and he's, so he's sitting there he's going he's like and he says the size like a, the less you do the more you do that was right the freshman won't go this thing is awesome and he stands there and he's like okay pop up so i'll say oh no no you got you need to do less do less than that pop up no you're trying too hard okay go again pop up no do less and then he just lies there and he says pop up does nothing and he goes you gotta do something man <laughs> <laughs> and, and the amount of times I, I'm, I'm and it sounds ridiculous but when I'm giving a lesson I'm literally chopping the dead wood out of someone's motion most of the time right taking the pieces I'm, out that don't exactly. need to be there I'm effectively telling them to do less so as funny as it sounds that's kind of everything I do in a nutshell in like two words that's beautiful. All right, so wrapping it up, guys. Uh, what are you working on now? I know you guys have had, you have some videos out, short game secrets. So where can they go to find that? And you know, time to uh, promote yourselves a little bit. Oh, they they can find uh, our videos at our, our website, shortgamesecrets.tv. Um, I. I you just put out a new project, right? Yeah, I, I project. just put out a, a, a bunch of new putting videos this last uh, December or so. Uh, we have our original uh, set that we did almost oh, four and a half years ago now. Yeah. Hard to believe. Wow. Yeah, how did uh, that come about? Oh, well, that's a great story. We should do that at the end. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, on the putting side, I'm still mainly just... Uh, uh, I, I teach very little at home. I, I do mostly uh, work on the road with uh, tour players or seminars or workshops and things like that. Uh, so I'm still trying to grow that, that side of my business. That's, that's where I'm headed. So what about yeah. you? Um, well, I've got all the answers now, so I don't really need to do any <laughs> research. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm, just, I'm constantly just trying to problem solve and figure out better answers um, for what I try and do. The thing is with my side of things I think as opposed to full swing for sure and, and putting to a degree when I really started to look at it initially I could count on less than one hand the number of people that I'd go and spend time with and actually learn stuff from okay, I think I'll probably still get now I mean if you if you want to become a better coach of wages who are you going to see I mean I think the list is short yes so I, I've been in the mode of figuring stuff out for myself. Uh, using seven, the 4D, right? So you're seven, involved with that. And a lot of, lot of 3D measurement using yeah, the 4D motion technology, which gives us a ton of great information. Um, so we can start to figure out what good players are doing and bad players are doing, what are the differences, why are poor players doing what they're doing. We've got a, a ton of answers from that. Um, 
chances of me releasing that as a video project slim to none. All right. But you, you talk about it in your presentation, so yeah, they I, can I, hire you to come talk I, at their exactly. workshop. I do cover your presentation. Yeah, we're not right. gonna we're not gonna divulge the information today. Yeah, exactly. I think we'll it's, leave them hanging a little bit. It sounds really harsh. But I think it's too good. <laughs> it is. I know. You were sharing with us a little bit before, so yeah, um, I, I'm sworn to secrecy. But. I mean, uh, maybe I'll do a video. And it'll be kind of the um, the outcome side of it. So this is how I teach what I teach at the moment to make people better, but without the background. Um, I think the, the, the background info is, is in depth and heavy, and it's something more for a, a real world, face to face environment. Um, beyond that, I just continue teaching good players and aspiring players and traveling and, and loving life, to be honest. You couldn't, it's not a job. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, what, that's why we know we love it, right? I'm no auditor. <laughs> no. No, sir. All right, so so wrapping up, let's. Yeah, I was going to ask, you know, what what would you like to discuss as a topic that we haven't discussed? And John had a nice lead in there of how you guys met. Yeah. So yeah. give us that story before we uh, before we wrap up. Well, we, we met on Match. dot com. <laughs> Swipe to the right. <laughs> it wasn't around there. <laughs> Um, well, this is this is more uh, of not necessarily about how we met, but how our, our business got formed. Oh, okay, how yeah, we, yeah. How we started short game gotcha. secrets. Yeah. And uh, I have a picture here of the original text exchange, and then I'll talk about what happened after that. So this was uh, October 2013, and I, I was going over to Spain for an Aimpoint European uh, Green Meeting Conference, and I got a text from James, and he says, "When are you going to be in Spain? Would you be interested in producing a short game film set with me?" Uh, and I said, I'm in Spain, November 13th to the 16th. Time is tight for me. Are you going to be there? I would love to if it works out. And he goes, I could be there, but we need a day really to get some solid filming in. Crud. Wish I'd known. Could have made a different flight. What's the video for? And he wrote, to sell. Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation <laughs> point. So this was, this was completely out of the blue. It was just... Uh, I'm not sure where the idea came from, or maybe it was something like, I think we're at a point now where we should do something, and he just started this. So, obviously the thing in Spain didn't work out, but James was going to not take no for an answer. He goes, well, I'm going to come to Florida, let's do something then. And uh, I said, okay, oh, whatever, that sounds great. So he flies over, and uh, I think you've got a brother-in-law who lives, or something, a cousin? A cousin. cousin. And uh, so he flies over to Florida, I fly down to Florida, and we meet up at the airport, and uh, he picks me up, and we go to Chipotle, that we went, or some, uh, yeah. some Mexican place. It may be Chipotle or Chili's or some, yeah. uh, I don't know, some so, high class. Right. So I, I'm not eating like I never do, and he decides he's going to have some lunch. And we sit down at the table, and it's like, okay, what are we going to, sh- what are we going to talk about? <laughs> what are we going to shoot? And he goes, well, I got a couple ideas. We'll maybe do this and this. So, and we're trying to, we're figuring it out like the day before it's going to happen. And we get done with lunch. And he goes, well, what we need to do now is we need to go get a camera. <laughs> we, we had nothing. <laughs> well, we, 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 had, we had a couple of Casio like, F8 yeah, right, or whatever with right. us, which the film was like 720p. It was just the quality was never going to be good enough. Yeah. So we, we head over to Best Buy. To Best Buy, yeah. yeah. This is at 8, 50, 8.55, and it goes at 9. And we're, we're still in like, the, the camera aisle. We're kind of looking at, we got no clue, yeah. We're looking at each other going, well, what do you think we can afford? <laughs> that makes so good. What, what, this video is there. How many are going to be? So five videos. What are we going to sell it for? I don't know. hundred dollars? Yeah, sounds like a good number. How many think we're going to sell? I've got no idea. How much is that camera? So it's like $700. Do you think we'll be able to cover that? <laughs> Seven hundred dollars <laughs> So what, what would happen if we sold like a hundred video sets? And I can see, in, I'll tell you, someone that's an audience, he's on his fingers. <laughs> he goes, he's like, oh. He's like, counting. He's like, that's ten thousand dollars. Okay, let's get that camera. <laughs> we said they don't want to close the store. We're trying to buy a camera. I'm on Amazon because I want to get an extra battery. And I go, can you price match? <laughs> can you price match on battery? Because <laughs> Amazon will yeah, sell Lights are starting to go off. The doors are starting to close. <laughs> and he's haggling over the price. She's, she's like, yeah, yeah, we'll price match. Right, just, just get out. You throw in that case too? We want that case. <laughs> so so we, we buy the camera and we head home. And the next day we arranged to meet up for the Floridian, which is yeah. called Diamonds. Got a timely let us use for filming. And we've filmed there since as well. Um, and that's about 45 minutes from my cousin's house. And I get there and I've forgotten the spare battery. And the battery that's in the camera has got like 50%. It's not going to get us anywhere. 
now I now have an hour and a half round trip to go back, get the battery. So obviously I end up doing that. So the morning is gone. And then we start trying to film in Australian microphones. And I had the ingenious idea that we'd be able to record the audio through our phones with a mic going through that cheap mic of the shirt. And it's windy. And the sound quality is horrific. And that's not going to work out either. Brian Chrysler is at the Floridian. He kindly lets us use his Sennheiser mics. And by the time we got this done, it's going dark. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're having an absolute nightmare. Yeah. First day. So the whole day written off, no footage whatsoever. Yeah. He comes back the next morning, he says, I, I tried to play, I tried to listen to it, it's completely worthless, we have to start over. It was it was awful, but the problem is we had like a half day. Right, you were flying out that night or something. We were both flying 2 p.m. or something, yeah. we? so we meet at 30 and 8, 8.30 the next morning, and we do five videos just straight. Yeah. No takes the entire time. No second takes. And that whole video so there's nothing. Every demonstration, every shot, every bit of audio, it's all first take. Wow. And we're in the can by lunchtime, and we're at the airport by 2. And then we fly home, and I have to learn how to edit. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's, awesome. Awesome. that's wow. a whole new can of worms. Yeah. So the, the whole story behind it is crazy. I, I built the website, I edited the videos myself, and taught myself how to do that. And then maybe you've got some months down the line, we start, start selling them. Yeah. And it's been like a ridiculous success. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the dream really, I think, for anyone is to, no, let me say it, like make money while you sleep. Yeah. Right. And we've got yeah. this video set that just sits there and you wake up and there are sales. Yeah. And it's yeah. just a continual, ongoing thing. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I think the five video set is still the best seller. Or, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, revenue wise, it's just. Yeah. Gross most. It's needless to say that we could have bought more cameras. Yeah, yeah, we, we made enough for the camera. <laughs> Fine now. We actually bought like, real mics as well. Yeah, yeah, we, we actually bought our own that. mics and bought a, I bought another camera for myself. Yeah, so it, it, I've not released a video since end of 2016. Yeah. But then John released some last uh, December. Yeah, and I we had shot some earlier than that, and but I, I had a video that I didn't want to put out for sale, kind of like James was just yeah, talking. No, I forgot that. Yeah, yeah, we have a whole video from John, a couple of videos yeah. that never saw the light of day. Right. Really? Yeah, because like, I didn't, didn't want to put it out. Yeah, it was, it was too, too good at the time. And then we couldn't put them out because you changed a few things right. that you do, so yeah. it wouldn't, wouldn't have been like yeah, the red picture. Oh, yeah. man. But the, the the, but the latest from John is um, like an updated, newer version of yeah. that same, yeah. that same content. That done. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's such good information. It's, uh, I mean, I recommend picking it up yeah. now. Market-wise, market <laughs> it's mostly coaches initially. Yeah. They bought it, but now it's You've had some players. It's, it outweighs, I think, by far now. Amateur golfers versus coaches. Gotcha. And initially, no one had a clue who we were all we doing, but now that yeah, the the balance has shifted towards players. Obviously, it's a much bigger market. That's awesome. Well, yeah. I know I've had a lot of value in it, and you've, I've learned a lot and shared a few uh, nuggets with my players and other coaches. So we want you to put more stuff out. So <laughs> how how the yeah. sorry go ahead. We were, we were we're considering a potential rebrand and a possible certification. Yeah. Thing. Okay. Yeah. The, it won't be a certification. It'll be an accreditation. Ah. ah okay. There's Different a difference. Yeah. There's a fundamental difference. Just like that first thing, we're just making this up as we go here right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just put it on the spot. You're in your yeah. first. <laughs> no, I, I've, I've thought about it quite a bit. People ask all the time, "Are you going to do a certification?" I'm like, "Well, no, I'm going to do an accreditation." Well, what's the difference? Well, certification for me is somewhere you can go and do a course, and you get your certificate and you stick it on the wall, and it's forever there. But an accreditation is an annual thing where I know that you're going to keep up to date with what I'm doing or what John's doing and you will represent the brand accordingly going forward versus someone that comes once and just has that forever. All right, so if we ever do it, then it has to be that way because I want to know that people are doing it right and representing. Probably. Smart. Yeah. yeah. So if anyone's got any good names out there, we're, we're yeah, hunting, we're hunting the, for The short okay. game secrets thing was, I think it was a nice name at the time, but there is, there is a pushback against yeah. that. Yeah. Well, yeah, give us give us a name. You know, how can they get a hold of you guys on your platforms? Well, you can find me on everything at, at John Graham Golf, yeah. YouTube, Instagram, uh, Twitter. I, I don't do hardly any Facebook anymore, um, but you can find me there. The, I think I'm the John Graham on that if you're 
looking for a link. But yeah, your you website it, as well. Uh, I don't have a website currently. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, but you can easily find you on Yeah, just put John Graham Golf in and you'll find me on everything. Yeah, James. mine's just James Rudyard, that's it, on Twitter and Instagram. Um, there is a Facebook page, James Rudyard Golf, but I don't really frequent it, so I don't expect a response. Yeah. Um, okay. And I contact each other on the website, which is jamesrudyardgolf.com. Um, but like I said before to people, if you send me an email, I don't reply straight away. Please don't get offended. It's yeah, like, you're busy. I'm busy. I've got stuff to do. It doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't mean that I've ignored it deliberately. It's just probably falling between the cracks as more and more stuff's come in. So yeah, 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 keep I, trying. I think one of the things most people don't know is James and I both have four kids, and you know, we, right. we do a lot of stuff Maybe. away from golf as because we're both family people. we you know those things are important to us. So sure, it's it's more than just golf for us. Well, I'll hook that up in the show notes, and you know, you guys aren't hard to find, and no. and. Like I said, everybody that wants to get better, you know, reach out to these guys, ask them questions, and they'll try to get back to you as soon as they can. But guys, thanks so much for being on the show. This is our Thank first you. episode, and uh, I think it was awesome. We've we've hopefully helped a couple of coaches out there uh, with a different mindset and some some great information. So please subscribe to my to my show, Golf Guru. You can find me on iTunes and probably on some other platforms here shortly. So until next time, we'll. Uh, share some more information. Thank you. Wow, this was so much fun to sit down with these guys and get some insight on uh, so many topics that maybe you didn't know about them, which I think is really cool. And that's part of the show is, is to give you some information and give you some stories that uh, maybe you won't get on other other podcasts. So Hearing from two guys like John and James, two of the best in the business, uh, was so awesome. And we're really fortunate to, to get these guys together. I know I've learned a ton this weekend just spending time with them as we do phone calls often. But to actually get to see them teach uh, live lessons is, is a once in a lifetime. So thanks for all the people that came out to the workshop. I know my members appreciated uh, the stuff that James did for the weekend and hope everybody uh, had a great weekend. So. There were so many nuggets uh, that you can take from these com this conversation, and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, don't be afraid to, to reach out to these guys and thank them uh, on Twitter or Instagram. Uh, you can find James at James Ridyard, and you can find John at John Graham Golf. And then make sure you go pick up one of their latest projects, if not all the projects, uh, the Short Game Secrets. And you can find that at shortgamesecrets.tv. I know that it will help your coaching I know it's helped a lot of players out there, but you can really get some insight on, on some of the things that they're teaching uh, that I think will really be helpful. Also, don't, feel, don't be afraid to reach out to myself and say hello on Twitter and Instagram. You can find me at Golf Guru TV, and I would love for you to tweet your number one takeaway from this podcast. That would be very helpful. This show was produced and edited by Brian Stringfield, and I am your host, Jason Sutton. Please throw me an iTunes review and a rating as the more feedback I receive, the better I will get. Until then, share the show with a serial learner like myself or somebody you think might enjoy this information as there's a lot more coming your way. But until then, as I always say, study, practice, teach, and then pass it on. Thanks for listening. Thank you for tuning in to the Golf Guru Show at Studio B.